not really a particularly religious word, just like Pentecost is not necessarily a religious word. <coughs> Shadowbo simply in Hebrew means weeks. And uh, that's it. Weeks. Shavuot is sometimes called the Feast of uh, Weeks or the Feast of Harvest. Uh, sometimes we call it the Feast of Pentecost or simply just Pentecost, which comes from the Greek word Pentecost being 50, because it's 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. It's a day after the seventh Sabbath. Sabbath is to be a day of rest, a day of uh, remembrance. They have uh, assembly, they have worship. After that seventh Sabbath is this day, Shavuot, which is also a type of Sabbath, also a holiday, a day of rest. There's significance in the fact that God wanted us not to work. He wanted us to rest in what he did. It's more than just not doing anything. It's pictures, it, it's sending a message to us. Shavuot is time of giving. In Acts chapter 19, it's, or Exodus chapter 19, it's believed that during that time frame it took place in the third month, which were in the third Hebrew month, Zimad. And many believe that it was during this time of Shavuot, that had been on the very day of Shavuot. But if we know it was the season that God gave in his Ahlamet Hadamri, the ten words, it was at this time that he gave the Torah his teachings, not just his not just the Ten Commandments, but everything. We talked about that last week. Bahar, on the mountain, God did not just give the Ten Commandments, but He gave everything. He, 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 and it all came from Mount Sinai, from the word of Adonai, God's words. And, and uh, He gave them to His people to instruct them. Some believe that, that the idea He gave this special opportunity for Israel, this people, and said, yes, we accept this opportunity. It's a time of giving, just as the Holy Spirit was initially given, as it's recorded in the book of Acts chapter 2, the Ruach HaKodesh, kind of giving was also required for the men to appear in Jerusalem and to give. They were not to appear before Adonai and the angels, the time for them to give. Uh, some, there are different things within the Torah that it's commanded to give. Uh, I actually forgot about it. I was actually told to break two wheat loaves and to do a little prayer and ceremony, and I forgot so. Uh, but, but that's not all that you've been told to do. Uh, there were animals that were to be brought and different things that were required uh, to be brought before the Lord and waved and, and as, as a uh, idea of thanksgiving and blessing. It was the wheat harvest, just as the uh, first fruit right after Pesach is the barley harvest. So it was a time of giving. It was a time of covenant. Just as it's believed that in Exodus 19, the Mosaic Covenant, and in Acts chapter 2, the Messianic Covenant, the birthing of it. It's a time of fire, just as there was fire on the mountain, the tongues of fire in Acts chapter 2 that were seen and were among the people. It's a time of rest. So it's a lot of different things we can read, a lot of traditions that people have attached to it that really have nothing to do necessarily with God's instruction. But it might help us. It's up to you how you want to do that. The Bible never tells us to just eat dairy or to stay up all night. All the various traditions that are associated with it. Some can be good. Some can be tiresome. If you stayed up all night, God bless you. Uh, I've done that several times. I, I don't see anybody in this room that did it with me, but we did that on a couple occasions where we were here, stayed up all night long, worshiping and studying the Torah because it was tradition. And some people really enjoyed it. Uh, and, and there were some good boys, but it, it is tired. And so different people do different things, not that traditions are bad, but then again, we just have to distinguish between what's tradition and what's not. We don't want to tell people this is what God said and God didn't say it. We want to know what God said and go with it. And especially when we're ministering to lost people that don't know that, we want them to understand. And we want to be a good light and we don't want to be some confused religious person. There's plenty of those out there already. I don't want to be another one. I want to be on the straight and narrow. I don't want to be a flake or a fruit. I want to be a bull, but I don't want to be a fruit cake or a flake. I don't want to be free. I've had a few of those. Years ago, we went to Mexico, and there was a guy there named Juan Casas. They called him the Apostle to the Mountains. He used to be Catholic, and I'm not sure if he's still alive or not. He was over years ago when we met him. And at a prayer break this one time, we all gathered there, and all of a sudden, Jesus starts prophesying over everybody. 
thought, well, this is the Bible, this is God's word, is this true? And he began to pray. He only knew what they told him in Catholic school, a Catholic church. That's all he ever knew. But he started looking in God's word and thought, if this is real, I want it. I want to see it. If some of this is real, some of the stuff, especially about the Holy Spirit, I'd like to see it, God. He began to pray some real prayers. Not Hail Marys, but some real prayers that have meaning from his heart. You know, we can pray some traditional prayers that they may not have meaning to us. Bless the Lord, thou Lord God, King of the universe, blah, blah, blah. It can have meaning to you, but if you're just speaking words just because it's the thing to do, maybe you should redirect and shift gears. So he shifted gears and he began to look and he began to pray some real prayers and say, God, if this is real, I want to see it. And the next thing you know, he began to see it. Some of the people that he was with, he prayed for them. And they received the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with tongues and prophesy. And he probably did that about three or four times on three or four different occasions and it was powerful. And he thought, God, this is incredible. I'm seeing it. And he said, God, I'd like to see it for myself. He didn't even receive it yet. He had been praying for people and they were receiving the Holy Spirit according to what he saw in Acts. And they were speaking with tongues and prophecy. He saw God was touching them. And he said, God, I'd like to experience that. And God touched him, and he finally received. Those of you that are familiar with Smith Wigglesworth, who uh, became a great preacher, matter of fact, this guy, Juan Bosses, that I mentioned, he was just an average looking guy. Just like Yeshua was an average looking guy, it says biblically. So if you're an average looking person like myself, or whatever, there's hope for you. If you're too good looking, I don't know, you may have to, uh, you know, People are always wanting to look better. But there's something more important than looking better. That's where our hearts and where our faith is at. Well, this guy won. He, he, he saw several people raised from the dead. He saw people that were completely blind and healed. He had such a childlike faith. See, so and if you read any of Smith, Smith Wiggle's worst writings that they wrote about him, he believed in Messiah. He was convinced that he had already received all the Holy Spirit that there was. And nobody was going to tell him otherwise. His wife was the preacher. He never went to school. I think in the end, some of you that are familiar, he never went to school day in his life. The only book he ever read was the Bible. In his whole life, that's the only material he ever read. He raised like 20-something people from the dead during his ministry later. At one point in his life, he was baptized with the Holy Spirit of God. And he realized, well, I was wrong. You know, I thought I was right, but I was wrong. Because something happened to me, and, and it, it wasn't like it was before. My dad, the Baptist, he was a preacher, a teacher, a minister. His dad was a preacher, teacher, minister. His dad was a preacher, teacher, mentor to many different ministers. Beyond that, I don't know. I don't have records of it. But uh, a different group, some were Baptists, some were Nazarene, different groups, not necessarily Jewish. I didn't really come from a Jewish background. But at one point, my dad started reading some material, and he started getting hungry. You know, there's something about being hungry that makes food taste different. <laughs> you know, if you're not really hungry and you're eating something, it can be really good, and it just, it just doesn't really, you know. But when you're hungry, almost anything can taste good. I mean, you know, just God wants us to be hungry. Yeah. He wants us to be thirsty for the living water. Sometimes we're not, but we need to be. Sometimes when we come in here to assembly, we need to be hungry. We need to be thirsty in order to really receive. My dad began to get hungry and thirsty, and he began to seek. And he began to read some information, kind of like this guy, Juan Moss. And he saw, you know, I'm reading about this experience they call the Holy Spirit baptism, the Ruach HaKodesh immersion. I'm interested in it. He began to seek. He went to all these different congregations. He told me about it. He, he actually passed away back in 83. And so, but he, I remember, as it, as it did one yesterday, he had told me I went to all these churches, and some of them were yelling at me, some of them were slapping hands on me, and all these things, and nothing happened. He said, I've got a little discouraged for a season, but I kept seeking. And I'd go to this group and this group. And, and for some reason, I was just having trouble receiving. But he said at one point, and he didn't give me all the details, but at one point he received it. And he said it just changed his life forever. He had told me that the uh, early summer of 83, and actually he had prayed for me that summer. And I shared with you briefly that summer of 83, I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I, I, I began to speak with other languages. I had 
never learn people. Sometimes we call them tongues, utterances by the Spirit of God. And I felt the presence of God on me for like a whole week straight. I believe it was at least a week. I don't know if you've ever been in a service where it's worship or whatever it is, and you kind of feel the Holy Spirit, you feel God, and it's just beautiful. During that summer, that experience, I felt God, and that presence didn't leave me for at least a week straight. I knew that something had happened different. Something had changed. I, I was a believer already. I, I believed as a young boy, even prior years to that. I, I remember it to this day. I can tell you the day, the time, the place. In that, in, in Galatians 3, it says, Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the year of the faith. And it goes on, it's, it's by faith. It has nothing to do with, with really us. It has to just do with us believing and receiving. A lot of things that God has to do with that. Believing and receiving and going forward. Boy, I tell you what, sometimes we can really get in the way. I've prayed over the years for many of people to be baptized with the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit. There's different ways of saying it. I've had some people receive immediately. And God just touched them. You could see it. And I've had, I've had some people that didn't receive immediately. And, and it took them a little while. And after a while, though, with different circumstances for different people, finally they received. I had a pastor friend that I used to be under years ago. And he said, boy, he fought with God almost all night when he was trying to receive this thing. Yeah. And he said, finally, he just gave up. And after he gave up and quit fighting, all of a sudden it just was there. There's just something about resting. Rest on Shabbat, rest on Shabbat. There's just something about the idea of resting that can empower us to go forward like never before. Even physical rest, when we rest at night, it helps us to get up and go again. If you've ever gone for a time without sleep, it does something to you. It can drain you. It can cause you to not think right. It can cause you to maybe get into error, to sin. Rest is important, not just physical rest, but spiritual rest pointing to faith in the work of God and the work of Messiah. I'm going to read a few scriptures here in the book of Acts as we have. If you want to turn there, you can. Acts chapter 1. I'm going to start there and we'll go forward here. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Acts 1, 4. I'll give you just 10 seconds. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Three, two, one. Don't you feel like God doesn't do that to us sometimes? All right, I'm going to give you 10 seconds. After that, that's it. You're done. Okay, God's patience. Because, boy, I, I wouldn't be more on that today if it wasn't for him giving me more than 10 seconds. Sometimes we do that with each other, though. I remember one time, my wife can't be here this morning. There's a lot going on. I've got relatives coming into town. But as I was putting out fevers, trying to find out if this was the one, and I thought, sometimes you've ever done that and you just give up. You said, I forget it. I, I, it's just not meant to be. And all of a sudden, as you give it totally up, all of a sudden it just happens, you know. Uh, I've heard people say there's just certain times where, where we're fighting against a God in ways we never realized. Right. Acts 1-4. And assembling themselves together, he charged them not to leave Yerushalayim, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For you shall not immerse with water, but you shall be immersed or baptized with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. In verse 8 he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Yerushalayim and in your and in your world, and even to the most extreme part of the earth. That word power there comes 
lot of church people in the car with me, taking them home. Look at that. The Bible says in Proverbs 18 that a 
or a tongue, it has the power of life and death. Well, why did God choose that? In Acts 1.8, it talks about the Holy Spirit being powerful. Speaking with tongues releases power of God. In Acts 2.4, it talks about them all, the 120 people, men and women, were all speaking with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That was part of the evidence that they had the Holy Spirit. It was evidence that something happened. It's a sign. It's, a, it's an indicator. It's not the only indicator, but it is one means. Not only that, it provides a way of prayer. You know, I've got a phone here, and I, it's a great means of communicating. When I grew up, I didn't have a phone. We didn't have a computer. Sometimes I wonder, my goodness, how do we communicate with each other? You know, we didn't have email. We didn't have any of that growing up. So sometimes it blows my mind. I think, wow, how did we, how did we do things? You know, uh, uh, I don't, uh, now the fight is some of them are saying you know, different things. They have phones. You know, we, we try to communicate with each other. You know, I'm telling my wife the other day, technology is amazing. And it's prophesied in the Word of God that technology and knowledge will increase as, as the last days go forward. But sometimes technology doesn't really help us in fact. Sometimes it hinders us more than it helps us. Mm -hmm. It can help us. But I wonder sometimes, what are we doing with it? Are we using it for the glory of God? Are we using it for the promotion of the Gospel? Or are we just consumed with it? Is it like a drug that gives us that, that gives in our time and our it's unnecessary. We think it is necessary. Well, anyway, how can you communicate with people? Hey, God's mark. God, in his infinite wisdom, gave the Holy Spirit as a means, another means of communicating with him. The Bible says in Romans 8 that it enables us to pray according to the will of God in Romans 8. It helps us to be able to pray for even things we're not aware of. It mentions that in Romans 8. In Mark 16, he said that it's a supernatural sign that confirms the word of God. It's a sign for the believer, not any particular group. It could be a Baptist, a Lutheran, a Methodist, a Pentecostal, a Messianic, whoever it is. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. If you're a believer, this sign can follow you. It can be a sign of evidence that there's something going on there. In John 7, Messiah talked about it being as rivers of living water. When we pray in tongues, we're releasing rivers of living water. Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 14. He said, I'll pray with my mind. I will pray with my spirit. I will sing with my mind. I will sing in the spirit. Paul said to the Corinthians, I spend a lot of time praying in tongues more than all of you. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're out of place sometimes if you're coming here and the whole service, you're just all speaking with tongues and nobody knows what's going on. I mean, uh, uh, you know, you've got to know the place for it. You know, I, I don't come here every week and just start speaking with tongues the whole time. Okay, that's a great service. Hey, man, let's go home. You know, I mean, there may be a time and a place where we do pray and talk. But, you know, uh, uh, and there are times and places where I do it, times where I may not. Times I do it out loud, times I do it quietly. We just use the wisdom of God. The Bible says that if we pray in tongues, it edifies the spiritual. The Bible says, all, all this is in 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going to read all of it. It says it's a wonderful way of giving thanks. And also in Ephesians 6, where it talks about the armor of God and it goes through all of that. It also says, and pray in the Spirit. Supplication in the Spirit. Well, what are what he's talking about there? Oh, just, you know, pray with a little more enthusiasm, some groups say. Yeah. Uh, you know, pray in the Spirit. That means just pray with a little more emotion. You know, uh, years ago, I, I, many years ago, I preached at this little Baptist church. Uh, actually, I'll tell you about it. Who, who all is winning now? They, they used to call Faith Baptist Church. I, I think I preached there a couple of times. And at 
initial baptism of the Holy Spirit of God, but there are many fillings. To be full, this word full can mean to be accomplished, furnished, supplied, to be influenced. Many times people were praying, and then they would get filled. Sometimes they would be worshiping, and they would be getting filled with the Spirit of God. The Bible says, don't neglect the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was mentioned there to Timothy as Paul was writing to him. And he also told him later, and he said, and it's not just for him, but it's for us. Stir up the gift of the Holy Spirit. Stir up the gift of God that is in you that was given by the laying on of hands. He, he encouraged him. Don't just talk about it. Don't just read about it. But stir up the gift that is in you. Don't just let it die dormant in there. Sometimes, that, sometimes there's things that just need to be stirred up. Smith Wigglesworth, he used to say this, it says, sometimes he said, the Spirit will move me. And then there's other times where I'll move the Spirit. He said that was one of his famous quotes. Because sometimes he, he, he had to stir up his Spirit. He had to stir himself up. He had to get, you know, sometimes we're just sitting around waiting, waiting for God to move us. And God may be waiting for us to move. Right. You know, the early believers did that. And God had to send somebody in. Paul, he had to send somebody in to bring some kind of damage control. And God may have to do that. And he does to his glory, be honored. If God has to bring in somebody, whatever their name may be, and he did that with Israel, you'll see him do that through history. Sometimes you have to allow somebody to come in and to shake things. And it's like, wow, I'm awake now. You ever been kind of half asleep and just something dramatic happened? I'm awake now. <laughs> God may have to do that with America. He may have to do that with our Western belief system here as it's sleepwalking many times. He may have a sense of things to say, wow, I'm awake now. It may be fearful. It, Paul, he was a zealous. He was putting Christians to death, as, it, as is mentioned there in the scripture. Zealous putting these people in their place. He held the, the, the materials of, of Stephen as Stephen was called upon the Lord and as they stoned him. God told him to go. But they were comfortable. Well, maybe he didn't mean now. Maybe he meant in the millennium. Maybe he meant in, in, you know, in heaven. I, you know, I believe in my spirit. God is saying it's time to go. And if my people don't go, I, I may need to send some people in to shake them up. There's other countries that if you read history, as God brought things in, and they began to get persecuted, and some of them even killed, an amazing thing began to happen. Revival, miracles. I mean, just, just people coming to faith. Who think just the opposite? Don't come down here to America. We're just blessed. We're just fat, happy. I mean, we're just, I mean, just the blessing. We just can't help ourselves. I mean, we just rest on Shabbat and joy. And I, I tell you what, I think there's going to be some changes. And I want you to be looking for them. And it's for the good. Sometimes you hear my dad used to say that good. I'm going to thank you. And it's for your own good. You know, here sometimes as a parent, I'm trying to present that to my kids, but sometimes I'm from here. I'm going to thank you, and it's for your own good. You know, God's going to do a lot of things. But as a result of it, no chastisement at the time is pleasant, but later it yields, and it breaks forth through your righteousness. The Spirit of God wasn't necessarily something just to bring us to make us feel good. But the Bible talks about the Spirit of Holy Spirit and fire. Fire. To get us moving. To get us stirred up. After I received the Holy Spirit as a young boy, I had to stay in my same position. I mean, things changed drastically. I got in church. I began to read the Word. I began to get stirred up like never before. To the point where it got me in trouble several times because I was so stirred up. I went back to the Baptist church and I told the Baptist pastor, I said, Baptist pastor, why well, something happened to me and I got baptized with the Holy Spirit. I'm speaking with tongues down.
you know, it's okay. You listen to this. Just go back and listen to whatever it was when you're rock and roll. And here's some material. You go through this junk. I mean, and, and so he didn't understand. He, 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 he didn't know what to say. You know, he'd never experienced that. He just, you know, just following his protocol. Oh, no, no, no. Don't tell him what he was thinking. He might have been thinking, oh, my God, this is yeah. <laughs>
powerful thing is to ask questions. That's why I am where I am today, because people ask me questions. And it got me stirred up, and it got me thinking. They didn't necessarily preach a sermon. They didn't necessarily convince me of something. But they just asked me a question at the right time, the right place. And I thought, wow. And, and it changed everything. Sometimes that's all you need. Oh, I'm not, I, don't know, I don't know enough scripture. I don't know enough that. You don't have to. There you go again, thinking about yourself. Get out of the way. He said, now you go think about yourself, get a very heavy education, and, and, and get a lot of titles and become very religious, because that's what it's all about, being very religious, until I get back. Because when I get back, I'm not going to see you just looking as religious and talking with as much religious words as you can, and that'll make me really happy. That's not in my mind, but maybe it's in yours. But there is a plan God did have for us. And unfortunately, it involves a dirty word, my son, that four-letter word, word. 